the back of summer heat during the NHL playoff, and instead of wearing heavy, hot hockey trucks, the league is outfitting every player with yoga pants for comfort and breathability. Hi everyone, this is Will O'Toole for Sports History on the Park Ridge uh, Television Network. And uh, I'd like to thank you again for allowing me to come into your home and for the next few minutes, <laughs> hopefully not a few hours, we can talk everything and anything about sports and a little bit of sports history and, and all the rest of it. Uh, again, it's a privilege to be part of the Park Ridge uh television, volunteer TV, and uh, I, I tell you, I've had a, a ball, just uh, no pun intended, just doing these little sports history and uh, opinion uh, segments for the volunteer TV, so I thank you again. This week, though, even though I started off with the hockey, I'm going to have a two-fold type of program, and the one is this, just talk a little bit about the NHL playoffs. I know that I've been talking everything baseball, but it is baseball season and it is my particular love. The NHL playoffs are set to begin and uh, they have the first round uh, components and uh, many of the hockey players are seeing it as a kind of like a March Madness because there are, um, not that they are single elimination, but you have uh, kind of buys and then play in and just total number of teams. It's pretty exciting. I know that in the New York metropolitan area, we're actually getting to see two of the three, the Rangers and the Islanders. The Devils have been, of course, eliminated, but you'll also get to see, you know, as you go to Central Jersey, maybe there's some more Flyer fans down there. What I do like about the NHL, and I'm not a big follower per se during the season, but I do follow the uh, Stanley Cup. And as I've said in previous segments, I think one of the most thrilling things in hockey and in all sports, but in particularly in hockey, is a 0-0 third period late action. And uh, the old cliche with the goaltenders just standing on their head, deflecting every shot that's zooming at them. Uh, it, there's nothing more exciting. And then hopefully to get maybe those rare occurrences, a nothing, nothing, overtime, sudden death game. Just incredible. I will tell you this, with the upcoming actions, there are some some exciting games, and again, I'm just doing this from twofold. I'm doing it from my heart. The teams I may be picking, I know that I'm going to probably get a lot of disagreement with that, but that's fun. That's the whole debate about hockey and, and all sports, that we can sit here and have some fun chewing the fat, chewing each other's ear off, telling them why you're wrong and I'm right. So that's the fun of it. But the first round matchup, I know that if we're going to equate this almost to a March Madness type of thing, uh, one of the components of the March Madness bracket that has gotten some coaches a little concerned, especially if you're the higher seed, is being put in that 5-12 slot. Because in the last few uh, years in the NCAA tournament, that 12 seed is a much better team than anybody realizes. And they can come in there and really put a thumping on that projected number five seed, which is when you think about it, the top 20, they are one of the 17, 18, 19, and 20. So they've had a really good season. And now you're putting them against the 12 seed. And in Phil and Phoenix, excuse me, the uh, Pittsburgh Penguins, who I have to be honest with you, was one of my favorite teams as a kid. Loved, again, their logo. Thought it was pretty crazy. Of course, they always stunk when I was rooting for them. When I stopped kind of following them, uh, that's when they really dominated Crosby and Lemieux and all the rest of it. Uh, they are going against one of the traditional teams in hockey, the Canadiens. And this is why I'm actually picking the Canadiens. It's 5-12. Canadians had a pretty decent season. I just... And they have, of course, behind them the dynasty type of persona that kind of um, you can talk about maybe now with the New England Patriots. They have that kind of pedigree. So they have that long history of being a dominant 
dynasty team in the NHL. So I'm looking for them maybe with the upset bid there. Carolina and the Rangers. Be honest, never been a big Ranger fan. Although I always root for them to get to the playoffs because I know they always play exciting, crazy hockey. This time, though, I think because they are rebuilding, I think Carolina outlasts them, and uh, it's going to be a good battle. And I, I see Carolina advancing there. Islanders against the Panthers. Again, Islanders. Wow, what a dynasty they had in the early 80s. But I kind of look for Florida probably to bounce them as well. And then number eight, number nine, everyone, this is always a crapshoot because uh, just like with the NCAA tournament, the eight, nine, it's a very competitive series. Usually there's not a, a blowout. And in fact, when they uh, arrange those eight, nine seeds, the selectors and the uh, schedule makers for the NCAA tournament really do a nice job. Very rarely do you see a blowout there. And if there is a blowout, let's say by extra digits, you know, by double digits, it usually comes late in the game. This time, though, I'm going to go with the traditional, the original team, the Toronto Maple Leafs. As I told in the previous broadcast, I love doing hockey jerseys, hockey uniforms, for whatever reason. I, I, the jerseys just, they have the logo in the front, the numbers on the back, and all kinds of striping. And usually they are two-tone. It's, it's uh, two colors. I know you have the Blackhawks. They have that slight green, but they're basically black and red. Uh, the Devils, black and red. So I like the Maple Leafs, and that's why I chose that for this week. Uh, it's just a simple blue and white, but it works so perfectly. Plus, they break all grammar rules with their name because it really should be in the real world. I rake the leaves mom and dad, on Saturdays during the fall, L-E-A-V-E-S. However, because of Jersey constraints and probably because they didn't want to pay the teller an extra few dollars, uh, adding in an extra letter, they are known as the Toronto Maple Leafs, L-E-A-F-S, which is always great. It's like with the Oakland A's. It's amazing to me. They're called the Athletics. And they add the apostrophe on their on their uh, hats and on their jerseys, but that's really grammatically incorrect because athletics the S just signals that it's the plural version of the uh, of uh, athletic, uh, and even that, you know, it's it's kind of crazy. Athletic usually it's an adjective here; it's being used as a noun. So uh, just for correction, but this is what makes teaching and learning English both so challenging, uh, so challenging, and also so uh, invigorating because there sometimes they have more exceptions to the rule than following the rule itself. So that is your English language uh, lesson of the day. Let's go back to sports because I'm even confusing myself. <laughs> Anyway, uh, in the Western Conference, you have the Oilers against the Blackhawks. I'm going to come back to the Blackhawks because I noticed this just doing some research. I'm going to root for the Blackhawks. Again, it's a 5-12, so I'm actually looking for uh, both number 12 seeds to knock off the higher-seeded fifth uh, seed. The Predators against the Coyotes. i got to be honest with you. I love that Predator logo with the saber tooth, so I'm not going against that. I have no clue about the personnel on either squad. I'm just going with the Predators because I do love that Sabretooth uh, Tiger logo. And of course you have number 7 verse 10, the Canucks versus the Minnesota Wild. There is a nickname. Just, I'm digressing again. It is really not a concrete noun. It's an abstract noun because what is Wild? They do have a great logo. How I wish though that they would have kept North Stars for the Minnesota North Stars because they had great, great uniforms. And I just loved the end with the star on top of it. I always thought that was great. Then they moved to Dallas and, of course, become the Dallas Stars. Gee, how original. You had the Utah Stars, the L.A. Stars. You've had so many teams nicknamed the Stars in the professional ranks. Can we come up with something a little bit more unique? Uh, and then 
in the number eight, nine. I'm going to go with the Jets. So I'm going to pull for uh, the eight seeded Maple Leafs to win in that eight, nine matchup. And I'm going to pick the Winnipeg Jets beating the Calgary Flames. Interesting. Uh, two things. If you know your hockey history, you know that the Winnipeg Jets were a WHA team and that they nicknamed themselves the Jets in honor of Bobby Hull. Uh, much like the uh, Cleveland Indians were named after one of their members on their team, a Maine Indian uh, chief, Sakalakis. I believe that's how you pronounce the name, but that was paid in tribute to the Indians. And uh, just been a, to me, a great nickname for the team. As I said, there's so much history wrapped up and so much geography wrapped up in sports that you can learn. The Winnipeg Jets, of course, alludes to Bobby Hull and the Calgary Flames. Remember, they were from Atlanta. And of course, they were named the Atlanta Flames, uh, probably as a historical reference to the burning of Atlanta. And anyone who has ever seen Gone with the Wind can attest that that was a city almost burnt to the ground uh, during uh, Sherman's run to the uh, coast where he burned everything down to the ground. So those are the first round action games. And of course, uh, as I said, I'm picking the Canadians, the Hurricanes, the Islanders, no, excuse me, the Panthers and the Maple Leafs and the Blackhawks, the Predators, the Wild and the Winnipeg Jets. There's no rationale. It is just more gut, heart, and just love of either nickname or tradition or whatever. But getting back to the Blackhawks, one of the reasons I'm rooting for the Blackhawks is that the Blackhawks and the Bruins were the last time you had two teams that were the original six that met in the NHL Finals. And the interesting thing, that was 2013. That's already seven years ago. The last time it actually occurred, you got to go back all the way to 1979 with the Canadians against the Rangers when the Canadians bested uh, John Davidson and the New York team four out of five. And I'm bringing that up because when you think about it, the NHL expanded from six to 12 in 67, 68. And then they expanded and then added or uh, absorbed the WHA. They've really done, when you think about it, a pretty good job of getting expansion or new teams into the thick of things. I was going through the whole list of uh, Stanley Cup champions, and it is amazing. You had two expansion teams. Well, I don't consider the Oilers expansion as much as they're being absorbed. Yes, new to the league. But those two teams dominated the 80s, each winning four cups. Uh, and having some of the most brilliant Hall of Fame players on their squads. And then you, uh, you had the Blues winning, of course, last year. And I know, yes, the way it was arranged, the Blues um, get into the Stanley Cup finals their first years in uh, the league as basically an expansion team. But that was because the NHL put all the expansion teams in one division and kept all the original six in the other. And uh, actually, probably that was one of the best moves that the NHL could have done because you were keeping like teams together. The expansion teams were getting probably brutalized every night by the original six. And I know there are some terrible teams in the original six, but it allowed them to really grow and maybe even develop some rivalries. Philadelphia, obviously, with Pittsburgh and all the rest of it. But they really did a nice job there. Why? Philadelphia has won a championship. Pittsburgh has won a championship. Uh, St. Louis has won a championship. Well, the Golden Seals don't exist anymore. The Minnesota North Stars, all right, they had to go to Dallas, but they've won a championship as well. And uh, so they've done a pretty good job getting those. Oh, and the LA Kings also won a championship. So of those five original teams, one doesn't exist anymore, the Golden Seals old California Golden Seals. But as I said, the NHL has done a pretty good job getting the teams inculcated into the league. 
and then having them really establish themselves as winners. And of course, just take a look at the, at the past winners. You had the Capitals finally breaking through, right? And a couple other, even Vegas getting to the championship round in their first year, pretty good as well. And almost becoming the first expansion team to win the whole thing, which is why I wanted <laughs> all of the teams to make it. That would have been 31 NHL teams. And then I said the crazy thing, just invite the new expansion team in. Just have them have a, uh, they could have had a really cool draft, have those uh, 31 teams, release some of the players, have them grab it, and just put all 32 teams in a real NCAA March Madness Stanley Cup playoff bracket and just see how far an expansion team with basically two weeks of practice could go in, in the Stanley Cup. It would have been kind of funny. Anyway, that's my take on the first rounds of the NHL Stanley Cup. I hope you enjoy it. I'll be tuning into that and watching. And uh, it'll be interesting to see if the Heat of summer, whether they have to do, if you recall years ago, I think it was like 92. I'm just going to say it's 92. I'm just going to look it up real quick. Boston, I think, played Edmonton, and they had to stop one of the games because there was fog uh, in the uh, in Boston Arena. Let me just see what year that was. It was 92. I'm working today from a different uh, venue. This is my son's computer room, and so I have Basically, I'm hoping to have three computers set up so we can have a little fun. Now, that goes back to 88. I'm pretty sure in that 88 series, yep, it was a sweep by Edmonton. It was their uh, second to last, well, they win in 1990. They're stopped by the Calgary Flames. But anyway, in that Boston series in 88, I recall, they actually had to stop the game because there was so much moisture and so much fog because of the heat contrasting with the cold of the ice that actually formed a huge cloud in the arena. Remember, these are played in June. So you can imagine what potentially might happen in the middle of July or August in some of these arenas when it really gets hot and uh, the ice really cools. And you may just see them, every player wearing headlights in, the, in addition to masks, uh, fending through each the opponent's lines to try to score a goal. Anyway, uh, this might bring a nice segue. I hope you enjoy the games anyway. Uh, segue. You know, baseball, as I've been saying, has been returning or will be returning sometime next week. They have been uh, practicing the players. I've been able to watch MLB Network, and uh, they've shown some kind of practice games. I have to tell you, it's going to be very tough putting these games in front of nobody playing. I mean, even when I play some softball games, at least there's a couple of people there. Yeah, they're usually the guys for the next game, but at least they're watching it. When you have nobody in the stands, I, I tell you, the emptiness. And then when you think about it, the vastness of the ballpark really is accentuated. It's going to be... Very interesting, and you wonder how much the players will be able to concentrate. That's what I'm saying. They're so used to having the fans boo or cheer them, or even he hearing the hot dog vendor saying hot dog or beer here, that it's going to be interesting how they're going to perform when there's absolute silence. I mean, when you think about it, baseball is going to be played the same way the PGA tournament is the masters and all the rest of it where everyone just is in complete silence and you can't say anything. Uh, and so it'll be an interesting contrast between the games of last year and this. Now to it, I've been on my podium, my soapbox ripping the new Manfred edicts. Um, and it's, Runner at second, extra innings. Probably his his point is to probably speed the games along, or that they won't uh, go on forever and ever. And oh, here's another thing. I was this this is where I'm digressing. I'm watching some of these players in these practice games, and they're still stepping out of the box to adjust their gloves or whatever. Come on. 
This is exactly what this is just practice. You're just getting swings in. You're telling me that you got to step out and then the pitcher's on the mound. It seems like they're struggling. I, I, I guess they're getting into game form, literally and figuratively, right? That they even have to go through all those habits and motions just to feel more comfortable uh, playing the games. But it was really, I think in one segment, I counted in, in about 30 seconds, all I saw was one uh, pitch and it wasn't even swung at. Guy steps out, adjusts, gets back in, the pitcher adjusts, and they finally throw. It's taken for another ball. It's kind of crazy. Like, just step in, just hit the ball. Come on, guys. This is one of the reasons why baseball is losing uh, interest. That there's so many stoppages in the game that aren't even part of the game that can be easily rectified. And you can say, well, you know, these players, they're playing for their kind. I, I get it. But can you imagine in <laughs> in other people's lines of work? If you kind of went through, and this is what I think of it, it's almost like the Ed Norton type of idiosyncrasies. And you know how that used to drive Ralph Cramden crazy. Can you imagine those kinds of things being perpetrated in uh, the office? Hang on. We got a big board meeting. Let me get set. I'm going to take the notes and all the rest of it. And there is one of the board members going through all the uh, conniptions that uh, Ed Norton used to go through. It drives you crazy. It's all what the ball players are doing. Think about it. It's all Ed Norton-esque. So I hope they can cut that out. Anyway, my new cartoon is really a graph. Basically, this is a chart. And my cartoon is entitled, Duh, with the D and the H highlighted. Do we really need the DH? Now, as you recall... In a past podcast or broadcast, I was talking about how I had discovered a writer. And, of course, I've lost it. I cannot now find it again. I'll have to go through the archives. But basically, he was talking about in 2015 how the DH was only responsible for 0.25 runs per game. Basically, that's an extra 40 runs for the American League uh, teams that they would realize at the end of a 162 game schedule. So really, and I am going to uh, give a shout out to the sources I use baseball almanac and baseball reference for unbelievable information that they provided when I was doing this. I basically did this and I'm working on an essay right now that I'm going to post on my website, otunescartoons.com. So I hope you can uh, visit it, but I'm going to have a little bit more in depth. I, Starting with a focus of this, does the DH really in increase what the American League owners wanted? And that was an increase in offense. They never mentioned an increase in home runs or doubles or batting average. All right? They wanted actually an increase in offense. And basically this, I took by the decades... And I will tell you this, I'm anti-DH, but I tried to give the benefit of the doubt to um, all the years for the DH. And I only used, Baseball Reference had a great thing. They have all the stats of all the teams, if you go on um, their website. And they have the average team runs per game. In other words, how much or what was the average number of runs that a team averaged per game when they played. So I took that and I'm just going to run down the numbers for you. And then I'll, 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 I'll put this up. And I did do the national league because I wanted to see if there was a difference between the American league and the national league by hoops and ladders. When I was doing a little bit more research on this, I discovered that the National League actually had flirted with the idea of using the designated hitter about almost 100 years ago, way back in the 1920s. And probably they had good reason because during the 1920s, well, let me just say this. Baseball in 1900 in the American League, each team, now remember there's only eight teams up until 1961 when they expand to 10, but 
that doesn't really matter because what we're doing is talking about runs per game. But baseball among the eight American League teams averaged, each team averaged 4.28 runs per game, meaning theoretically not um, 8.56 runs were being scored in a contest, if you think about it, on the average. Now, the team, let's say, uh, that was number one was probably averaging about five. And the team that was last in runs per game was maybe about three. So the two of them together give you, you know, uh, the average runs. But what they did was they took the average runs per game, totaled up all the runs, divided it by 154, and of course by the number of teams as well, and they got their number. 4.28 in the 1900s. Then, of course, 1910, it falls from 4.28 to 3.93 to change a 0.35. Well, I'm just going to say 35 points, so I don't put the decimal point in. All right. But baseball historians will tell you that 1910 to about 1920 was considered the dead ball era, meaning that the ball was uh, didn't go anywhere. Remember that they didn't have the abundance of balls in supply for the umpires. So they used the same ball. The spit ball was allowed. The grease ball was allowed. Uh, if a ball was was tarnished in any way by mud, dirt, uh, shoe polish, or whatever, that ball remained in the game. It did obviously have an effect, probably on the ball players. All right, to the point of that baseball dropped to three point nine three runs being scored per game by each team during the decade of the 1910. But 1920, it zooms almost a complete point to 4.89 or 489. As baseball, probably this, 1910, I'll give you a perfect example. 1910 or 1915, I think is Babe Ruth's first year, he comes up as a pitcher. He does play as a, as, as a hitter and hits some home runs. But basically, if you think about it, Babe Ruth, 1920s, introduces really the home run into the game. And Zoom, almost by one total of one full point, runs per game increase from 393 to 489. And I think that you can definitely attribute that. Do you realize that Babe Ruth, at one point in one season, actually hit more home runs by himself than entire teams did? So uh, maybe a discovery, an innovation. Hey, listen, the home run ball is very important to the point where the following season or the following decade, decade, and this is the greatest decade in the history of baseball in terms of runs scored per game and probably in general over time, overall offense. But baseball uh, goes to 5.25 runs per game scored in American League contests. And that's why I have it up here. Down here, I have the star. So that's 1930. Now you have the murderous row of the Yankees, but you have the Philadelphia Athletics, who had some great teams there. Al Simmons, Jimmy Fox, etc. You had um, uh, Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig and a host of other stars in the 30s. All right. Baseball zooms up to 5.25. But in 1940s, psh, there's almost a one point drop from 5.25 to 4.34. I attribute that to a number of things. 1940s, you have pitchers adapt, adjust, and adopt. And by the way, in the 1930s, uh, that's the decade that the spitball was outlawed. All right. There were some guys that had the grandfather rule in that, but Basically, you have the uh, spitball outlawed, so maybe fresher, uh, cleaner baseballs are used in the game. Not only that, but there was probably, I'm just trying to think, baseball might have gone through some also uh, new ballparks being used or uh, being built. I want to check on that. All right, but in the 1940s, though, all of a sudden, I think the pitchers uh, adapt, adjust, and adopt uh, to the new changes and to the hitters, the way that the hitters. Now, there's another thing, too, that I didn't uh, harp on, but during the 1930s, you got to remember this, too. 
if you've ever seen the old gloves, they were not as uh, manageable as today. It's not as flexible as today's gloves. I think that there has been, you know, whenever you play these games, and I think this is what's missing sometimes fans miss, is that whenever you have an improvement on one side of the ball, there's going to be guys who go back and say, how do we take that advantage away? And then there's improvements on the other side. All right. So the offense went sky high. Managers and probably players went back and said, and particularly pitchers and said, how do we uh, stop their advantage? And they do in the 1940s to the tune that it goes down to 4.34. There is an uptick in the 50s, 4.43. And I think this can be attributed to this, that in the 50s, maybe more in the National League than the American League, you have an influx of African-American players. You remember that Jackie Robinson comes into the league in 1947 and then uh, 1948, the Cleveland Indians bring in uh, Larry Doby as the first African American player in the American League, and then you know teams follow through as the last of the American League teams to have an African American player on their roster are the Yankees with Elston Howard, I believe, and the Boston Red Sox with Pumpsy Green, Elijah Pumpsy Green. Nevertheless, 1950s. 4.43, there's an increase of nine points in hitting or in runs per game. Let me just get that right. In runs per game. This is an ERA. This is runs per game. All right. Uh, the reason why I say it's runs per game, too, is that baseball reference doesn't include earned runs per game. It's all the runs that you score. All right. So with today's players, there's just not uh, better defensive players, and the gloves are so much more flexible. But there's definitely better defense. You know, when you if you saw some of those old gloves, it's amazing that they even caught and fielded with some of them. And today's ball players, I mean, just go to YouTube and just see the unbelievable plays that even quote unquote mediocre defensive players are making, and it's phenomenal. All right, so 4.43 goes up, and then. <clears throat> Come the 1960s, and this is the decade, and this is where my argument comes in, uh, the decade where the owners, I think, get real concerned about the way the game is being played. It plummets to 4.05, so it loses 38 points during the decades of the 60s. And then in the first three years, 70, 71, 72 of the 70s, Baseball even goes down to 3.84. That's the lowest. In fact, those three years uh, were the lowest in the American League in their history. Now, problem is, baseball saw, or the American League owners saw, from 4.43 in the 50s all the way down to 3.84, a loss of 60, 59 points, or 0.5. Really, when you think about it, it's a loss of about 80 runs per team which seems like a lot, but it really isn't. Why? Because as you can see, and the, even the National League, the way that I, I had their graph, it, it goes up, it goes down. It's almost like a mountain range. So there are cycles. And again, I would say this, during the 60s and probably the 70s, here's what was occurring. There was not just better defense. Well, there is better defense in the name of pitching. Because if you recall in 69, it seemed to be that was the advent of the relief specialist. And prior to that, for the most part, your starting pitcher in 1900 through the 1940s and probably the 50s, your starting pitcher obviously went and started the game and more likely than not completed the game. How do you know that? Just take a look uh, statistically at the number of complete games, the all-time great pitchers were finishing, and even the 500 pitchers at the time were finishing. You, you know, you have to remember that the bullpen in the early part of the century, of the 20th century, was relegated to the guys who either had a bum arm, had a bad outing, or were deep in, in the bottom of the barrel for the coach, and that they were relegated to the bullpen 
that was seen, that was deemed as an outpost, a gulag, so to speak. But again, here's where the managers say, how do I get an advantage or how do I equalize? And during the 60s and 70s was the advent of the relief pitcher. And when you're only, as Ted Williams one time said, that by the time the third, uh, my third at bat against the same pitcher, I knew everything in his arsenal. I basically knew or expected I knew what was coming. It was very easy to hit after that. And I think, though, what's happening here now in today's game, you may face that starting pitcher maybe twice, but then you're facing three new pitchers in a nine-inning game, each one vastly different from the one before. There's more of the use of lefty-righty matchups or lefty-lefty and righty-righty matchups today. There's more use of what I like to say, the Earl Weaver index cards, where they have so much statistical information on these players that it made hitting much more difficult. However, with the advent of the DH, here's what occurred. It goes from 3.84, and during the uh, second half of the decade of the, of the 70s, from 73 to 79, goes up to 4.29 in the American League, goes up to 4.47, Goes up to 4.86 in 1990. Still not at the level of 1930. And still not at the level of the 1920s in the American League. It finally, at 2000, in the decade of the 2000s, it peaks at 4.91. Still not as high as the 1930s. And then... Uh, during the decades of 2010, and we're going to see now, starting a new decade, what happens. It plummeted almost half a point to 4.49. I really think what the DH really uh, has done with the game is it's changed the strategy of the game, but it hasn't improved the game offensively. It really hasn't. And that you can see that baseball has gone through these hills and valleys, or actually mountains and valleys. And that's still, no matter what baseball does, they will probably never exceed the 1930 decades for hitting. Because even in the National League, I do have statistical breakdown of the National League. In the National League, that was also their highest. Um, that was also their highest season in, in, in baseball history. They, in 1930, they were at 4.62, which was their highest, but it was still lower by a handful of the American League. And you can attribute that probably to the fact that maybe the American League was playing in smaller ballparks, all the rest of it. Plus, you had the New York Yankees, which had an effect. All right. To wit, though, what has the pre-DH in the American League has meant 4.43 runs per game for each team. And the post-DH, yeah, it's gone up but only by 0 0.20. It's 4.63. Now, I'm not an accountant, and I've run the numbers time and time and time again. I might be off by, let's say, instead of 4.63, it might be 4.627. I doubt it. Because I've done the numbers. I've run the numbers over and over and over again. And as I said, I used the baseball almanac and baseball reference for my help. But, um, 0.20, basically every five games you're getting an extra run. That's what you're saying right now. So has the DH really afforded the American League this inflation of runs per game? Remember, that's what it was for. Yeah, home runs are ton up. Actually, this is what I really believe right now. Why do, you, do I think? Well, I think everyone is going up there to swing for the home run because of all the trajectories, all of that information about the men with the use of the metrics. And I don't think anyone's getting on base to score runs. That's one thing that might be hurting the game. Not only that, but if they're not swinging for the fences, they're striking out. So no, nobody's hitting the ball in play for a potential maybe an error or just a tweener base hit to put men on base to score runs. Remember, I'm not. they weren't interested in home runs. They were interested in getting runs home. It's a big difference. All right? And... In the National League, post-pre-DH, 4.24. Post-DH, 
post DH, I'm not making this up. The National League actually has scored more runs per game, 4.34. Think about that. Still under the American League, but above, all right, pre-DH. And I think maybe what you're seeing in the National League, potentially, I know it's 0.10, so that's 10 games. every. So they're actually scoring 16 more runs per game now than they did pre-DH. But it's still an improvement. And they haven't gone to the DH, which is why I wish they wouldn't go to the DH. So there's more to this than um, just, you know, there's more. I, the theories are out there. As I said, I just think there's better defense that wasn't appreciated and all the rest of it. And of course, uh, the improvement in pitching and how they use pitchers, etc. I just want to, so I'm going to, uh, hopefully we can post the DH and as I'm uh, running this, you'll, you'll understand it. But just in uh, tribute, I want to show you some of the guys that were the original DHs for their teams. And of course, we all know Ron Bloomberg was uh, the original designated, uh, the first designated hitter. Of course, I don't have a picture of him. Um, these are some of them. And take a look at what they kind of players they were. Tony Oliva, injured knee. Frank Robinson, up there in age, but still could give you the home runs. Down on the bottom, oh, there's Frank Robinson when he played. He was the California Angels. Uh, for the most part, their designated hitter in 1973. It's a great picture of Frank. And you know what I love? Take a look at Frank Robinson where he's choking up on the bat. Guy with 586 home runs. And I don't know whether he's fooling around in this picture or not, but look at the muscles on him. But he's choking up on the bat. Tony O, of course, a rookie who led the league in hitting. All right. Down over here, this is Lee May, Carlos May's brother. The reason I bring up Lee May is because after Tommy Davis uh, is the original DH for the, the Orioles, actually Lee May moves in there and becomes their DH. Carlos May, uh, this is a 70 card. Remember, he blew up half his thumb in a mortar accident while he was uh, work, uh, doing Army. I think he was working either in the National Guard or the, uh, you know, doing Army Reserves. I'm going to throw that away here. Um, Oscar Gamble. I could not find a, <laughs> I don't think he ever found a hat that could fit his fro, but he's one of my favorite players of all time. And here's another one, Gates Brown, who hit 12 homers and 50 RBIs as the DH. He was known as a great designated hitter, acquired his nickname from his grandmother, I believe, called him Gates because that's what he used to swing on, Gates, when he was a little kid. He's also a former, uh, I think he was uh, served and, uh, you know, did some time in the Michigan State Prison, and then came out and played baseball, a la Ron LaFleur. Down on the bottom. Durin Johnson, notice a first baseman at the end of his career becomes a designated hitter for the Oakland A's. And this fellow here, Gail Hopkins, was the DH in their first year with the Kansas City Royals. And of course, they quickly replace him with Hal McCray when they make a deal later uh, in the in the seventies. They they get Richie Scheinblum, the Reds, for basically um, Hal McCray. These are the last ones. Alex Johnson, first DH for the Rangers. And down on the bottom, Louis Tian was the first pitcher to face a designated hitter, Ron Bloomberg. This is Will O'Toole for Park Ridge Sports History. I thank you again for being uh, for allowing me to be a part of your time. And uh, I look forward to doing it again next week. Thank you.